Welcome to episode 74 of the Family Answer Man podcast, where today we're unpacking the message of Christmas with the doctrine of salvation from a biblical worldview on the Family Answer Man podcast. I'm your host, David Ortis, and I'm here with Dr. Mark Crosby, pastor, educator, marriage and family therapist, and resident expert here on the Family Answer Man podcast, where we tackle tough questions that families face, and we discuss practical solutions that really do work. Now, this podcast is not a therapy session. We're not able to give specific specific advice to your situations, but we do believe that mental and spiritual health are very serious issues and that family dynamics can be and often are very complicated. So for in-depth answers to your questions, I want to encourage you to seek professional counsel specific to your unique circumstances. But if you would take a second right now, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, do all the YouTube things, hit the bell, uh, subscribe, so you will always know when the Family Answer Man is on. And if you're listening via podcast, take a moment to uh, rate and review us on your favorite podcast app. That really does help us out. It gets us up to the top of the feed, and that'll help others out as well. Uh, If our content has helped you at all, we definitely want to ask you, share the Family Answer Man with your family, with your friends, so they can join you on this journey of building stronger, healthier, happier families. Well, Dr. Mark, it is good to be here with you, and uh, we are getting into the uh, Christmas spirit, and um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Christmas and salvation, and Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do people usually tie those two together, or is that something that we haven't tied together uh, enough? I think there was a time when we did. I think there was a time when... Christmas was focused on that angelic announcement, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, mm-hmm. which shall be for all people, that unto us is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so for, for many years, I will argue, that hopefully was the focus of the Christmas season. Unfortunately, today, as we've said before, um, many, many in our culture have <clears throat> excuse me, secularized Christmas to yeah. where now Christmas is nothing more than, you know, buying things for people that you don't mm. like with money that you don't have <laughs> and, you know, having all the jingles of various myths of whether it be, you know, singing chipmunks or, you know, <laughs> flying reindeer, which is fun. I mean, I'm not discounting that necessarily, but the, the focus and emphasis of Christmas uh, with the original intent was, again, to remind the world that Messiah Jesus has been born into the world to bring salvation to all who call upon his name. And that the gift that he offers, the gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so it's that gift that we celebrate, or originally was to celebrate, if you will, uh, for for Christmas. Mm. And so I think, unfortunately, that has gotten watered down, not only uh, in our business world or in our day-to-day culture, if you will, but also even in our churches. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid that churches do not present the gospel, they do not present the doctrine of salvation in a way that uh, the the Bible uh, basically gives and shares. Uh, and again, this is not true of all churches, of course, but many of our mainline churches, unfortunately, have gotten away from the uh, evangelism and of the pure gospel message of that salvation is by faith in Messiah, by the grace of God. And so we've gotten away from that message. And so Christmas, I'll always argue, is a reminder that Jesus came into the world to seek and to save that which is lost, to bring salvation to all who call upon his name. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him does not perish but has everlasting life. And that message is all about Christmas, and Christmas is all about that message. I love it. I love it. I know the Advent season, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in a uh, in a, a tradition that celebrated the Advent right. season. It was more just you celebrate Christmas. Right. And so later on, I re- you know, I realized and learned that, you know, Advent, there's four Sundays. Mm-hmm. Two were designed to look at the second coming of Christ, mm-hmm. whereas the other two were to look back at right. his first coming. And, That's right. And exactly what you're talking about of, uh, you know, salvation being uh, the ultimate gift that we are given during right. the Christmas season. Right. Right. So uh, that is a decent little segue to our yeah. question for the day. Right. And uh, and if you want to send in your questions for the Family Answer Man, uh, you can email us, familyanswerman at liveoak.church. Again, that's familyanswerman at liveoak.church. We would love to hear from you uh, and love to hear your questions and hopefully answer them on air for you. Uh, so this one uh, came in via email, and um, it says, Big question on how Jesus could forgive a mass killer, or worse, mm-hmm. at the last moment if he simply states, I'm sorry for my sins, forgive me. Yeah. So today on The Family Answer Man, we'll be putting on our theological hat. <laughs> um, you know, most of the time we put on our 
uh, family psychology hat, which is fine, but today we'll put on our theology hat. And the reason why that's important is because, again, these are the kind of questions you will have around Christmas dinner. Right. These are the questions you'll have maybe around Thanksgiving dinner. These are the questions you'll have maybe after church on a Sunday. These are the questions you'll have, you know, on the way home from your midnight mass or your Christmas Eve service or whatever it may be. And so... And the question has a lot to do with how does one know they're going to heaven? Mm. You know, how do we know that our uh, family member who passed away this year or last year, whenever it may may have been, how do we know they went to heaven? And what what constitutes or or guarantees our place in heaven, if you will? And so these are questions we all ask. And so we're going to put on our theology hat today. So for all the listeners, I hope you'll kind of pay close attention. Uh, Because the reality is that your theology, whatever your theology may be, we all have a theology, even the atheist has a theology, which simply means my understanding of God, right. or my study of God, or how I see God. Mm. And so even the atheist has a theology. And so the, the point being, though, is that, as we've said before, your theology is your foundation mm. on which you build your life upon, uh, because your theology determines your philosophy, how you see life, how you see the world, etc. Your philosophy, as you said before, determines how you see your choices. What are my choices in a situation? And then those choices determine how I see my decisions. And the decisions that you make in life determine your success or failure. So the point is, is that we all build our lives on whatever theology that we have and wherever that theology may come from. And so as followers of Jesus, and most of our listening audience, I think, would subscribe to this, our theology comes from the Word of God, the Bible. Mm, yep. Those 66 books uh, that we find, uh, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, and from here comes our theology. And so um, to answer this question, there is a lot in this question that I'll argue that's not being said. Uh, okay. And there seems to be also some misunderstanding about this person's uh, soteriology. Now, soteriology is a fancy theological word for the doctrine of salvation. And so, and so, and there is some confutation built into this question. In other words, some pushback uh, as to how salvation occurs, because this person is basically saying, "Hey, can you know, if you're a mass murderer or worse, or maybe you're a you know mass murdering pedophile or worse, we could you know add, continue to add to 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 this person's uh, sin, but how is it that?" Jesus can forgive that person by simply saying, I'm sorry for my sins, please forgive me. Right. And so there is some contempt, I think, kind of of brought into this question. But let's go ahead and answer it and and unpack that a little bit. The first point we must make is this. Uh, The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Yes. So the doctrine of grace, we're saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2 makes it very clear. Saved by grace through faith, not of works. So the salvation, uh, the gift of salvation is simply that. It is a free gift that God gives. You don't earn salvation. You don't deserve salvation. It is a free gift. It is given by the grace of God found in the Lord Jesus. Uh, Romans 6.23 says, The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the reality is, no matter who you are, no matter how to no matter how good you think you are or how bad you have been, the reality is no one works their way into heaven. Right, which is the first first misconception you have to wipe off the board is there's not a, a, there's no scales of justice in heaven. There is no there's no ledger that you, nope. you got more good than bad. Nope. As we've said before, again, if you if you try to take the argument I want to do good things that'll outweigh my bad things. First of all, you have forgotten ninety nine point nine 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 percent of all the bad things you've ever done. Okay. I'd <laughs> like a, to forget those things. Yes. Yeah, that's the first thing. <laughs> Second of all, again as we said before, that's like saying to a judge, I robbed three banks, okay, but look at all the banks I didn't rob. So right. so you know, so your 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 justification by your works never works. Yeah. Uh, according to the Word of God. So again, as we've said before, other examples that we give from time to time, and we give this to our youth or whatever. But, you know, if if you have a glass of milk and someone takes some polluted water, I'm trying to keep this fairly PG, but someone takes some polluted water and pours into your cup of milk, do you drink it? Absolutely not. But if someone drops two, you know, green flies into your milk, do you drink it? Absolutely Mm -hmm. not. The Mm -hmm. point is this. It's not a a matter of how much is in there. What's the matter of is the fact that your milk is polluted. Right. Okay? Right, yeah. The point is that's how it is for our soul. Our soul Mm -hmm. is polluted by sin. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a couple of lies we told or if we killed, as this person is saying, you know, 200 people. The fact of the matter is, yeah, the consequences may be different, 
But the reality is your soul is still polluted. You're still not worthy of heaven. Right, which leads to, you know, Romans 6, 23, the wage of sin is death. That's exactly. where the consequence comes but in. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, so indeed. grace is receiving then. If we're saved by grace, people ask, what is grace? Grace is receiving favor, blessing, and hope when we don't deserve it. Mm. So the way that I go to heaven, the way you go to heaven, the way anyone goes to heaven is by the grace of God found in the Lord Jesus. So the point is this. No one obtains salvation, this is the point we're just trying to make, by their own merit. It's only by God's grace through faith in Messiah Jesus. Second point is this. The next major point is that sin separates us from God. And sin, not paid for, covered, forgiven, keeps us from heaven. Yeah. So sin separates us from God. And even worse, if you will, sin that is not paid for, not covered, not forgiven, keeps us from heaven. Whether as it's, whether it's a, a lie or gossip or a mass murderer, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm. So the person who wrote this question in, they have fallen short of the glory of God. Right. The mass murderer they talk about, That's they have fallen, fallen short. short of the glory of God. Yeah. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Thus, when a person sins against God, judgment and payment is required, mm. which means this. One of two people are going to pay for your sin. Okay. Either so you're going to, either you're going to pay option. for it. Okay. Yeah. Either you're going to pay for your sin, uh, because, and because you've sinned against an eternal God, there is an eternal judgment, mm. or Jesus is going to pay for your sin. Yeah. Those are your options. Yep. Which is why Jesus came into the world. Which is why again Christmas means so much to so many. It is a reminder. Mm that Jesus came into the world and the angelic announcement was given, behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Now, notice what the angel says here. Again, and we read this every Christmas, good news, great joy, all people. Yep. Not all good people, <laughs> not all white people, not all black people, right. not all nice people, not all mean people, <laughs> good news, great joy for all, all people. people. So the mass murderer and the gossiping grandma, okay, <laughs> both fit into this category. There is good news of great joy for all people. Mm. Now, what's amazing to note is that this was predicted in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 53. Yep. Isaiah 53 gives a prophetic description of Messiah. And Isaiah gives what I'll argue seven major points, Isaiah 53, seven major points about what we call substitutionary atonement, which is a fancy way of saying Jesus paid for our sins. Mm -hmm. Jesus took on the judgment of our sin. Jesus took our sin and God placed judgment on Jesus for what we've done. So whether you're a mass murderer, or this person is talking about in her question, or a gossiping grandma, Jesus took on our sin. And here are the seven points. It says in Isaiah 53, and please take a moment for those who are listening, read it yourself, but, but he bore our griefs. The Bible says he bore our griefs. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, he was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgression. So we have this, he bore our griefs, he our sorrows. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. So you begin to see that Isaiah is giving this sense of the fact that Messiah took on our sin, mm. our shame, and was judged for what we did wrong. For what we did, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the Bible goes on to say in Isaiah 53, the Lord was pleased to crush him. It goes on to say, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he, God, will see that and be satisfied. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is, as Jesus takes on our sin, as God, again, crushes him, pierces him, um, you know, by his stripes we're healed, as God brings this judgment upon Jesus for our sin, our sin is being judged and paid for. Hmm. Wow. Okay? And so and then, and then you hear that, those very words in Isaiah 53, my servant, talking about Messiah here, will justify the many. He will bear their iniquities. So Jesus now becomes the very payment for our sin. 
So whether, again, you're a gossiping grandma or a mass murderer, right. Jesus pays for our sin. This is why in John 3, 17, Jesus says, For God did not send uh, his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Right. The goal is always the salvation of the world. Exactly. So, so, so here you have Isaiah giving this prediction of what Messiah is going to do. Which, by the way, the yeah. prediction was given 400 years before Christ. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, actually, this is not... This yeah, is, yeah, before then, actually. Yeah, but yeah. Seven, 700, 700, sorry, yeah. 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 Before, before, so, so this prediction was given by Isaiah as to what Messiah is going to do. Mm-hmm. Psalm 22 uh, was written a thousand years before Messiah was born, <laughs> and that was about the crucifixion right. of Jesus and, and what would happen to the Messiah on, on a cross. And at that moment, the cross or death by crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. So, so Jesus makes it clear uh, in John chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, um, that again, God sends his son into the world so the world may be saved. And, and I love, we all know these passages, and we, we all love them, but I'll take, take, take a moment and just you know, read them just for those who maybe aren't that familiar with these passages. But it says in John three fifteen that whoever believes may in him have eternal life. That whoever believes may in him, talking about Jesus, have mm. eternal life. Uh, he says in John 5, 24, an, another very popular scripture that many know. It says, for truly, truly, this is Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has, present tense, okay, eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. So here you have Jesus saying that whoever believes in him has eternal life, that whoever uh, believes in him, believes in his word, believes in him who sent him has eternal life and does not come into judgment. So the gossiping grandma or the mass murderer who believes (laughs) in Jesus because he has taken their sin, because he has paid for their sin, no longer faces judgment, but now has eternal life. Now, uh, there's other scriptures to look at real quickly. John 6, 37. It says, all the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. (laughs) So whosoever comes to Jesus, whether you're a gossiping grandma (laughs) or a mass murderer, whosoever comes to Jesus, his promise is this, I will not cast you out. Yeah. So for the person who's driving right now, who feels like, you know, you've sinned so greatly, so terribly that not even God can forgive you, just know if you come to Jesus, Mm -hmm. if you turn to him, if you call upon his name, if you believe in him, he has promised, I will not cast you out. Those are good tidings of great joy. Exactly. Uh, John 6, 47, Jesus makes it as simple as possible. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. There Mm -hmm. it is. And so he makes it simple. Now, there's two case studies that we need to look at about this question, because this question has to do with, okay, these these mass murderers who say, you know, hey, uh, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's two case studies we need to look at about people who were indeed mass murderers who found salvation. Okay. Uh, The first one is the thief on the cross. Now, we call these, these two uh, malefactors who, who are on the other side of Jesus, Jesus being the middle, thief on his right, thief on his left. That, too, was predicted and prophesied as to what would happen. Right. But we see the, we call them the thieves on the cross. Now, the reality is in our uh, vocabulary, if you will, in our verbiage, these were terrorists. Yeah, we've kind of adopted thieves just based off of some old headings in, right. in the Bible and some right. old translations. They but, were terrorists. Yeah. They were murderers. They were insurrectionists. They were enemies of the state. And yes, they were thieves. Okay. <laughs> Included that. And so, so, so th- but, but these people are so uh, egregious, if you will. What they've done has been you know, so terrible that they are facing capital punishment, yeah. death by crucifixion. Mm-hmm. And so they're murderers. They're insurrectionists. We don't know how many people they killed. But let's just say it's more than one. More than which one. Which now is mass. Okay. <laughs> So back to this lady's question, the mass murderer, well, here's the one. Okay, so you have the thief on the cross. And the thief on the cross says these words, as he is dying, Mm. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Such a powerful statement. Powerful statement. How does this insurrectionist, murdering, thief, terrorist get into heaven by calling upon the name of Jesus. 
He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he's saying that Jesus has a kingdom. He's, he's believing that Jesus is going to rise again. He's believing that Jesus is now the person, the Messiah, the long-awaited uh, deliverer. Right. And he calls upon his name. And Jesus says, because of that, because of that faith, in, in essence, today you'll be with me in paradise. Mm. Another mass murderer mentioned in the Word of God, Saul of Tarsus, yeah. who becomes the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. Uh, again, to whom most of Western civilization is based upon. And so, and he also writes these words, we're saved by grace through faith. So again, mm -hmm. the point we're trying to make is this, is that, is that Jesus is the ingredient if you will, the focus, if you will, for salvation. Right. Now, the concern I have about this question is this, and that is the premise on how Jesus, this is the question, how can Jesus forgive when all one says is, I'm sorry for my sins and forgive me? Mm -hmm. I almost argue that this person left out the key ingredient. Okay. Because no one says, no good theologian that I have ever read says that salvation is found by saying, I am sorry for my sins, forgive me. Right. Where salvation is found is exactly what the Word of God says time and time again. Believing on the Lord Jesus. And break that down, unpack that. That's a, that's a phrase that people may have heard but may not understand. Right. So basically what you're saying is, is that when I believe in the Lord Jesus, what I'm believing him for is my salvation. Mm -hmm. Not that he just existed as a historical figure like Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or George Washington or Socrates or Plato, whomever, right. but I believe in Jesus for my salvation. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose from the grave. I believe mm -hmm. that he is the one who took on my judgment and has forgiven me of my sin. And that goes way beyond just a simple, I feel bad, classic, your kids get caught. They yeah. apologize because they got caught. Doing yeah, I'm sorry, bad, right? forgive me. Right, yeah, that yeah. goes a lot yeah. deeper than that. There's a lot of proclamation in that. So the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 verse 30 says, what must I do to be saved? Mm. Notice what the answer is. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou <laughs> shalt be saved. There lies the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, this person is, is making a statement, but they're le le leaving out a very important ingredient on how salvation. Again, the question is, how can Jesus forgive a mass killer or worse at the last moment if he simply states, I'm sorry for my sins, forgive me. Well, again, you're leaving out the primary ingredient. Right. The mass killer, like the thief on the cross, like the Apostle Paul, what saves them is not them saying, I'm sorry for my sins, forgive me. It's believing on the Lord Jesus for their salvation. Yeah. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 16. Mm. You know, the, the, the words in there, I'm sorry for my sins and forgive me, is not found in John 3, 16. That's a true statement. For God so loved the world, mm -hmm. he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him does not perish but has everlasting life. Right. You do not see the word repent in that, in that verse. You don't see the word sorry for my sins in that verse. You don't see the words forgive me in that verse. What you see is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him doesn't perish but has eternal life. So again, that's what Jesus told Nicodemus, a very religious person, a ruler of the Jews. Now again, there, there's, there's the issue of remorse is important, yes. Right. We're not discounting remorse right. over sin, nor are we discounting the forgiveness of sins as being important, or, or seeking forgiveness, I should say. Mm -hmm. Seeking forgiveness is important. Remorse over sin is important, yes. But the reality is you can be sorry for your sin and you can want someone to forgive you Ooh. and still not have salvation. Right. If you discount or dismiss or, or discredit the person of Jesus or believing in mm -hmm. Jesus for your salvation. Mm -hmm. So salvation, according to Jesus, is believing in him. Why? Because he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin, that we might have the righteousness of God in him. So here's the point. Jesus traded places. He who knew no sin became sin. What does that mean? It means this. All the sin of all the people, of all the world, of all time, fell upon Jesus. Wow. And so when you think about that, all the sin of all the world, of all the people, 
of all time placed on Jesus. So again, the sin of the gossiping grandma and the sin of the mass murderer all was placed on Jesus. So when he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's all been paid for. What he is saying, exactly. What he's saying is, is that God is now forsaking his only son as all the sin of all the world, of all mm. people of all time is now placed on him. God is now punishing sin. Mm. So salvation, though free, it's not cheap. Uh, it's not. So we're forgiven because our sins have been paid for. Our sins have been judged by a God on the person of the Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. So, but not only does God take our sin <laughs> off of us and put it on Jesus and judges our sin by punishing Jesus, if you will, in return, Jesus gives us his righteousness. Wow. So what has happened now, the mass murderer or the gossiping grandma who believes in Jesus <laughs> Not only has all their sin taken off of them and placed on Jesus, but all of the righteousness of Jesus is now placed on them. Wow. And you're going, well, I don't feel righteous. Well, this is not about your feelings. Yeah. It's about what he has already done for us. So the point is this. Jesus came into the world to not only take our sin, but to give us his righteousness. Yes. And that is what makes us fit for heaven. Right. That is how the mass murderer, the pedophile, the gossiping grandma, Mm. because if all the sin of all the world of all time was placed upon Jesus, that means all the sin, name the person. Jeffrey Dahmer, Adolf Hitler, Mm. uh, name the person. Joseph Stalin, me, you, the listening audience. If all the sin of all the world of all the people was placed on Jesus, then that means, again, he who knew no sin became sin. Yep. And so that sin was judged. And when we put our faith in what Jesus has done for us, he takes our sin, gives us his righteousness, and makes us fit for heaven, giving us that grace and that free gift of eternal life. Now listen to the angel. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy for all people. Yep. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Once you receive this gift... Then you begin to understand God's grace. Once you receive this gift, now you begin to understand how salvation was made possible for you. For Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me really never dies. And then he asked this question, four words. Do you believe this? So the person who wrote this question You need to ask yourself this question. Do I believe that Jesus took my sin upon himself, the sin of every mass murderer, the sin of every gossiping grandma, and therefore God judged that sin upon Jesus so I could be set free? You need to ask yourself the question, do I believe that? Because once you do, and you experience his grace, and once you do, and you experience his salvation, there is a love now that comes pouring into your heart. There is a thankfulness that comes pouring out of your heart. And what you want now to do is that you want others to know God's grace and you want others to know God's gift and you want others to know God and his amazing son and this God who created us and who gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him doesn't perish but has eternal life. And that is the message of Christmas. And there you have it from the family answer man, the true, real, full message of Christmas. Great tidings, of good tidings of great joy uh, that we have the gift of salvation that has been given to us through Jesus. I want to just thank you for uh, being with us again today. As a reminder, this is not a uh, therapy session and we're not able to answer specific situations, uh, but we do believe that uh, that the Word of God is able to uh, speak to your heart. And we hope that uh, this message of Christmas uh, will land with you today. And we hope that this episode of the Family Answer Man will encourage you and inspire you to make changes that will lead to a stronger, healthier, happier family.